Hello, everyone. Welcome to a conversation with Allison Janae Hamilton and Michelle Lanier, entitled Rooted Black Women, Southern Memory, and Womanist Cartography. My name is Sarah Scriven, and I'm the program coordinator, one of the program coordinators for today's event. And it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Sharon Harley. Dr. Sharon Harley is the principal investigator and project director of the University of Maryland and Andrew W. Mellon Foundation African Black Diaspora Research Seminar. She is an associate professor and former chair of the African American Studies Department at the University of Maryland. Dr. Harley is the recipient of the W.E.B. Du Bois Fellowship at Harvard's Hutchins Center and the Woodrow Wilson Foundation Center for International Studies. So welcome and we'll turn it over to Dr. Harley. Thank you, Sarah, whom I've already referred to as the program coordinator, coordinator uh, extraordinaire, because she's truly that. In 2019, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation awarded the University of Maryland's African American Studies Department funds to launch a new interdisciplinary African diaspora studies research seminar that will examine how nationality, ethnicities, race, and gender help reshape identity among first and second generation African immigrant populations and native born blacks in the US. The seminar and related public events bring together expert and germane perspectives from distinguished senior and rising junior scholars, graduate and undergraduate students and the wider public to explore race, ethnic identity and the social and cultural interactions between and among diverse Black populations. The grant supports research seminars like this one, so ably co-hosted by NYU professors, Dr. Deborah Willis and Dr. Michael Gomez. A foremost goal of the Mellon funded project is to engage in public discourse that will facilitate more informed and nuanced dialogues and understandings of identity formation, largely in the US. The first research seminar meeting occurred in October, 2020 at the University of Maryland. It will include in the fall of this year, a Smithsonian Museum program and will culminate with an international meeting at the University of Ghana in June, 2022. The Mellon Project represents the dedicated work and commitment of the University of Maryland's diaspora team, including Drs. Lynn Bowles and Dr. Mario Serum, Program Coordinator Sarah Scriven, as well as Dr. Nolisha Crawford, Erica Fuentes, Sahai, and Afis Hadakon. Today's exciting public event, Rooted Black Women, Southern Memory, and Women as Cartographies, will be uh, well, is a highlight of, of this uh, two-day seminar. Dr. Deborah Willis and Dr. Michael Gomez, the co-host, will introduce our presenters. First, Dr. Deborah Willis is university professor, director of the Center for Black Visual Culture and chair of the Department of Photography and Imaging at the Tisch School of the Arts at New York University. She is the recipient of the MacArthur, I still say, Genius Fellowship and a Guggenheim Fellowship. Most recently, she's the author of Black Civil War Soldier, A Visual History of Conflict and Citizenship. Dr. Michael Gomez is Silver Professor of History and Middle Eastern and Islamic Studies at NYU and is Director of NYU Center for the Study of Africa and the African Diaspora. Notably, he supports the struggles of Black people everywhere. Dr. Willis. Thank you. I'm really happy to be here. I am honored um, to introduce Allison Janae Hamilton, one of our speakers. Allison is a multidisciplinary artist working in sculpture, installation, photography, and video. She, um, Hamilton has fuses land-centered folklore and personal narratives into haunting yet epic mythologies that address the social and political concerns of today's changing Southern terrain 
including land loss, environmental justice, climate change, and sustainability. And I just want to acknowledge that this Southern cultures is the reason why we're here today. I read it over the summer. I was infatuated and enthralled with Tika Selman, who edited this issue that brought these two speakers together. Dr. Gomez? Yes, thank you, Dr. Willis. Uh, it's my pleasure and delight to introduce Michelle Lanier, who is an Afro-Carolina folklorist, an oral historian, a museum professional, a filmmaker, and an educator with over two decades of commitment to her callings. I am also delighted to convey that Ms. Lanier and I were at Spelman together uh, in another life some years ago. And so it's a delight to see her once more and I'm looking forward to her presentation. Michelle Lanier. Thank you, Dr. Gomez. So I believe I am going first and I am going to start with gratitude. Thank you, Deb Willis. Thank you, Sharon Harley and Michael Gomez, Sarah Scriven, Erica Puentes, and of course, Allison Janae Hamilton. And always, always thank you to my mother, Margaret, who is an ancestor and who watches. Now for the story. You are witnessing a real-time meeting of souls. Dear viewer, Allison and I, in actuality, have never spoken at length but her Afro-Southern merging of spirit and flesh, magic and dirt in the forms of photography, installation, sculpture, taxidermy, and so much more spoke to me long before I heard her voice. Such is art. Uh, I'd like to now share four of Allison's uh, photographs. These are among the six images that Tika Selman and I chose to accompany um, my Southern Cultures essay that Deb Willis referenced, Rooted Black Women, Southern Memory and Womanist Cartographies. And a link to that whole piece will be shared in the chat, I believe right now. So the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to walk us through um, these four images once by in saying their titles, and then we are going to look at them again, uh, accompanied by the vocal offerings of uh, Nina Simone singing Obeah Woman, which was recorded in 1974. And it's really important to acknowledge that Nina Simone was born in Tryon in what I call the borderlands of Afro-Carolina's Northern and Southern realms. So I'll begin to share my screen. All right. So we will look at these together. Okay, so we start here. Presencia and Pheasant to 2015. Um, I see a woman who appears to be rising from the earth. She is rooted and powerful. She looks like a church mother to me, but also a goddess who has returned from the hunt. This next image is three girls in Sable Palm Forest, 3, 2019. In this image, I am reunited with my girlhood self. I am remembering the forest that had palm trees and Spanish moss um, in Beaufort County, South Carolina, also Afro-Carolina. So we will see these again momentarily. This is scratching at the wrong side of firmament 2015. When I gaze upon this image, I ask myself, where is she running? Who is she running from? Who is she running to? What do the trees know? This image is called Florida Water 4 2019. I'm asking myself, is she, as Sister Dr. Alexis Pauling Gums would say, undrowned? Is she a daughter of the people who could fly? Can she walk on sea bottoms? 
Is she caught up in what Christina Sharp would call the wake? Is she navigating what Catherine McKittrick would call demonic ground under the water? And so I would like us now to keep company with these images uh, with Nina Simone. So I'm going to start to play and hope that the volume works well for us. Hey. together now. We are witnessing together. Simone. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and share some additional reflections. So in Rooted, um, I share some of these words that I'm going to offer to you today, and I'm going to ask that you allow them to wash over you as waves, offerings, and invitations to a womanist and Afro-Southern journey, a sojourn. One, Placing my childhood feet. Beaufort County, Southern Afro Carolina. I began bonding with the land and the people and the land and the people of the low country are intrinsically tied. I learned to move in that land and was drawn to her mysteries most of all. My mother screamed when she saw a black snake on our back porch, but I was intrigued by its flesh, its rhythm. I would gently pull the prehistoric horseshoe crab by the tail to make designs in the sand with her feet. The dead jellyfish who hadn't made it back out to sea was subject to my dissecting sticks. I would feed marshmallows to an alligator and we should hopefully see an alligator um, from uh, Allison soon. I would indeed feed marshmallows to an alligator that lived in our neighborhood lagoon and I somehow survived scratching its back with a long branch, acts I now know to be dangerous and extra legal. I ran from trees that seemed to sprout worms in the spring and dug fossilized crustaceans from white sand earth. I became mesmerized by the marshes at sunset, grasses emerging at low tide, golden, sometimes wind bent, sometimes erect in the humidity. If it had been permitted, I would have stood barefoot, calf deep in the muck, searching for pearls in the oyster beds. In my nine-year-old dreams, I believed I could shapeshift into a mermaid, diving over and over into the crest of the smaller waves, arcing toes in the salty air, fingertips touching sea bottom, sand, pelicans overhead, dolphins in the near distance. I yearned for gills to breathe at the bottom of this murky brown coast. I still yearn for those gills. I yearn to find something, a message, a marble, a button, a bead, from the ones who didn't make it. The trees too were my sanctuary. There seemed to be stories in their understory, memory in the moss, ground truth in the loam, hidden worlds in the branches I'd climb. Two, a new way of knowing. 
womanist cartography recenters black women and femmes by rendering our narratives visible, audible, legible, and autonomous, I'll add self-determined. The goal of this approach is to renegotiate black femme presences in the American South. These are restorative and counter cartographies, womanist cartography. And they're not just about healing the wounds of memory. These are methods used to also illuminate joy and the spectacular, as well as daily acts of common humanity. So we bring in the artists like Allison, the poets, the painters, the benders of light and sound. I envision women walking ancestral lands in pilgrimage, dancers on the battlegrounds, horns in revelry over streams that carried those running from bondage, t-shirts announcing their names, billboards, more billboards, hello wide awakes, shouting their legacies, more memorials, more monuments. Three, reclaiming the roots. A womanist cartography of Afro-Carolina begins with revisiting Afro-Carolina landscapes through Afro-Carolina narratives across the land. Virginia Jenny Graves Williams of Caswell County in the northernmost northern realm of Afro-Carolina said this, as a child, I was spoiled to my granddaddy. What he did was he planted a whole field of popcorn for me because we used to run through his corn and damage it. So he said, I'm planting this for you. We had a tobacco barn. I would go up there when they were curing tobacco at night. He would pop popcorn and roast sweet potatoes and bake apples in ashes. Virginia's mother's name was Ruby Apple, Ruby Apple. Ruby apple. Certainly the Carolina soil must recall the feet of Ruby apple and her daughter, Virginia Graves Williams and Ella Baker, Littleton, Afro Carolina, along with sculptor Selma Burke, Mooresville, Afro Carolina, along with visionary painter, Minnie Evans, Pender County, Afro Carolina, comic genius Loretta Mary Aiken, also known as Moms Mabley Brevard, Afro-Carolina, Roberta Flack, Black Mountain, Afro-Carolina, Shirley Caesar, Durham, Afro-Carolina, Harriet Jacobs, Edenton, Afro-Carolina, Polly Murray, also Durham, Afro-Carolina, Charlotte Hawkins Brown, Henderson and Sedalia, Afro-Carolina, Anna, Julia, Haywood, Cooper, Raleigh, Afro-Carolina, and of course, again, Nina Simone of Tryon in the borderlands of the Northern and Southern realms of Afro-Carolina. Four, we ask more questions. For the particular experiences and lived dreams, uprisings and survivals of all black Southern women, how do we reveal the hidden markers of their, our lives on the land? How do we populate a map and find our way back to our mother's gardens time and time again? Thank you, Alice Walker. Where are the maps that trace the trails to our ancestral mother's horrors and hallelujahs? Who twirled in crinolines in tobacco warehouses to Maceo Parker's horn? Who grinded a mean and sensual dog in juke joints and at homecoming dances fueled by corn liquor and love? Who sat, who sat dignified and festooned in pastels at the Church of God in Christ Kojic Pink Tea? Who hosted the girls' dormitory strategy sessions at Bennett College for Women? on a freedom making February in Greensboro. What are our ancestral mother's names? What did they call their journeying lands? What did the soil look like, smell like where they laid their heads? What are the names of the soil, the actual names of the soil that held and hold our mothers? What were the ecosystems that witnessed their fallings and uprisings? What was the bird song that sang them to sleep and woke them up at dawn? Where 
is the compendium of our ancestral avian witnesses. Where are the elevation maps of our mother's dreams? Where is the GIS map that will lead me to the janitor's closet? Where warm gingerbread was left for a weeping brown girl sent by her people to integrate a university? Who were the groundskeepers and housekeepers and cafeteria cooks, also brown, who whispered the weather forecast of her heart as her feet took her into classrooms cloudy and thunderous and white supremacy? What were the lullabies sung in their nursing ears? What made them laugh? Who were their loves? Home is not a strong enough word to describe the relationship between the black daughters of the South and her lands of origin. What are the words? Intrinsic, coexistent, paradoxically intimate, destructive, nutritive, reflective? The red and black and sandy tan of Carolina soils mirror her black daughters and that we too are a spectrum from cream to midnight. We too have been plowed without consent into terrifying production. We too have sunk and risen above waters. The voices of the South by black women of the South are distinctive as Anna Julia Cooper knew. These four mothers held a bird's eye view of the South, watched from their hearths and dress folds, their mortars and pestles and gleaning lands, watched through their wombs, this womanist cartography, this counter narrative that unearths what the land subsumed, calls and compels a leaning in, a listening to, a beckoning closer to witness what the land has witnessed. We heal, we expand the table of memory, we surface the obscene, the taboo, the commonplace, couching, the act of revisiting cartographies through the lens of black womanhood calls for new language, the language of listening to land and water. That's what Allison helps us to do through her work. And we can say this, footprints, fingerprints, heart prints, soul prints transform through this lens, this paradigm from marks to monuments. The clay knows the hand, the land knows the feet, the souls know the land. What is this land? Afro-Carolina, the Afro-South, without the souls of black women. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, we will follow up after Allison. I am honored by this experience. Allison. Hi, everybody. Um, it's really good to be with y'all today. Um, Michelle, that was such a beautiful piece. Thank you for sharing it with us. Um, I'm seeing standing ovations in the chats, and I'm giving one uh, to you as well. Uh, so many of those words reminded me of um, growing up uh, myself, you I, you said corn liquor, it reminded me of my aunts who used to make uh, persimmon beer and muscadine wine and so many of those things that you were saying, um, bits and pieces of each stanza really reminded me of my own relationship to the landscape. Um, when you were talking about, you know, the different animals and I, I thought about the lizards and the, you know, the snakes and all that that I grew up with um, as well. and. I guess I'll tell you a little bit about my background. For those of you who don't know, um, I was born in Kentucky. Um, I was raised predominantly in Florida. Um, actually, where I'm sitting right now is about a 15-ish minute drive from the Georgia border. So I'm like at the way top of the state of Florida. I actually, normally I live in New York City. I live in Manhattan and my studio is in Manhattan, but I'm from down here. And so I've been spending most of this uh, wild 
pandemic year at, back home. So I'm coming to you uh, today from Northern Florida. And um, my family's kind of root system on my mother's side is from rural Western Tennessee. We're in a tiny county called Carroll County. And um, it's just farm country. And so our family farm is still there today. My grandma still lives there. And um, that's pretty much where my cultural basis is really a mixture of, I would say, Tennessee, um, which is my maternal land, and then also Florida. And my dad's side of the family, um, Michelle, is from, my dad's dad's side is from the Beaufort area. So who knows, we might be cousins. <laughs> um, but anyway, I'm going to um, start and I'm going to share y'all some, uh, a few, share with y'all a few images from this part of Florida, because this neck of the woods is part of the country that I think most Americans aren't uh even really that familiar with i think most of the time when people think of florida they think you know south beach and the art world we think of um, art basel or maybe disney world or what have you and um for a few years my dad's job had taken us down to the southern part of florida but the irony is kind of the more north you drive in the state of florida the more culturally uh, kind of the american south you get so let's go ahead and i'll show y'all um show you all some of the images and thank you um for uh moving ahead in the slideshow for me. So these are the um, landscapes. So this is, uh, this is again, uh, where I'm at now. Um, that's me. <laughs> I go out on the rivers a lot. Um, and a lot of people ask me, you know, how I make a lot of the photographs out on the water. So if y'all have any questions about that, um, you're welcome to, you know, ask in the Q&A later. But a lot of what I do when I make my videos and photos, I'm usually out just like that on a boat um with you know under a series of like underwater cameras and just different kind of things um sometimes holding the tripod down with my foot and <laughs> paddling through but this is one of our blackwater lakes um in the area and you can keep uh, you can go to the next slide please and this is the dead lakes this is about maybe 20 minutes from here in the car um again just to kind of give you a sense of like this part um this part of uh of florida um you can go ahead and and move forward please thank you um to the next slide yeah and so these are just that's fine. This is Tate's Hell, which is down in Caraval. This was, I went out um, during manatee season. This was last year. So that's just like a little iPhone photo that I took while I was out on the boat. And that's me with, uh, um, we were out, I was out with two friends of mine uh, making Wasissa, um, which is a video. I don't, I don't remember if that was one of the videos on, um, on, uh, on the docket for today, but I'm actually showing it April, April 1st through April 30th coming up. Um, in Times Square. So I'll, I'll be putting more information out about that. But that was the day I went out and shot Wasissa. And um, we happened to uh, come upon this. It's just like a swimming platform, like a like kind of, I don't know, someone probably put it up there years ago. And this alligator was um, sunning itself out on the uh, diving platform. Um, you can keep going, please. Um, this is down one of our springs. This is this area of the country has more springs than anywhere else um, in the states. And part of um, there's been like a kind of environmental fight with a lot of big water companies are trying to come in, Nestle and what have you. And so there's been a lot of really hyper local um, fights over water systems that really mimic a lot of what's going on. Um, throughout the country, but really throughout the world. And so a lot of my work touches on these um, battles over landscape, whether um, that's in the past and history or through to the present day, and um, how landscape and um, climate change and migration, it's really all bound up in this American um, saga and that you can really trace the history of a people and their uh, current lived experience too, with just really looking at the landscape in the same ways that you can look at music or food or all these other elements of culture. Um, we can continue, please. This is one of our caverns. We have a cave system down here that most people don't know about. And these photos are either literally just iPhone photos or just photos I just screen grab. Um, and so these are not like artwork photos, but I just wanted to give you all a sense of, of where I am and just this part of the country where I'm from. Um, you can go ahead, please. Thank you. Um, this is the Slave Canal, which is a famous um, canal that was dug out, um, as the name suggests, by the labor of the enslaved. And the purpose was to bring cotton from Georgia through the panhandle down to ships waiting in the Gulf of Mexico. If you picture the state of Florida in your mind and you have the panhandle and then you have like this little dip before the rest of the state begins. So I'm in that dip and we call it the Big Bend. Um, it's also known as the Red Hills. If you think of like Georgia red, 
red clay. Well, you know, we have it up here too. <laughs> um, so this is the Red Hills region or the Big Bend region. And so it's a very skinny part of the state where there's just two counties. There's the Gulf of Mexico, then there's Wakala County, Leon County, and then it's Georgia. So it's a very narrow passageway. And the Slave Canal's purpose was to um, bring cotton straight through. But um, thing is, as soon as it was built, um, the railroad came in town. So it was like immediately defunct as soon as it was completed. So now, um, you know, it's just um, this waterway, people fish there, and um, it is still here today and down in Osceola. Um, okay, next slide. Okay, so now I'll show you some actual artworks. And um, they are mostly, um, like I mentioned, influenced by where I'm from, whether that's Florida, Tennessee, you see a little bit of everything, whether that's the flora and fauna that um, appear in the works that you can actually hear because I'm, <laughs> I'm in an indoor outdoor hybrid space. So forgive me if um, you'll probably will start to hear a lot of birds because we're uh, coming up on sundown. So it's going to get probably a little noisy, but we'll just consider it part of the atmosphere <laughs> of today. So this is Florida Water 4, which uh, Michelle showed. Um, this I shot at the head springs of the um, Wasissa River as well. Um, and you can go ahead into the next one, please. Um, Three Girls in Stable Palm Forest 3. So this uh, is, as the name suggests, it's a palm forest that we have um, here. And you know, a lot of times people think of palm trees, they're really like landscaped, especially in um, when you think again, like South Florida, Central Florida, you might see like two here and three here kind of um, landscaped um, like perfectly. And, and so I'm always trying in my work to think about tourism and think about these um, icons of tourism and icons of the economy that um, and kind of flip them on their head. So I shot this out in a, a forest of, of palm trees, which uh, most people don't uh, get to see because usually palm, palm trees are very, you know, nicely orchestrated on this side of the building, a couple on that side of the building. So I thought it would be interesting to take the viewer into this forest um, of palm trees. Um, please continue. Thank you. Um, this is part of a series I did called Sweet Milk in the Badlands. And so there's this cast of characters of, of uh, Hanks, and that's basically um, like what we say down here to mean like ghosts or spirits or kind of ancestral um, um, kind of apparition like uh, figures. And so for this series, they're kind of these guardian figures uh, over the landscape. And this one, her name is Doll Baby, and she always appears either with this stag head or with the braid in front of the face. And so all the characters have these habits and places where they go and and um, characters that they take on. And so there's kind of, it's really an intricate cis organizing system um, that I rely on myself as an artist in ordering it, but I don't really um, put it all out there for the viewer because I like for the viewer to be able to fill in their own um, storyline as well, of course. And so I try not to be too prescriptive, but I do have kind of a, there's, you know, um, a, a, I have a love for epic mythology. And so there's this kind of mythological kind of epic long arc of a tale that, that I try to carry from series to series. Um, next slide, please. Um, similarly, this is another one of the hate figures. This is scratching at their wrong side of firmament. And I shot this just up the road on the way to Bainbridge, Georgia. And I, we were actually going to shoot somewhere else and I found this abandoned church. And you can't tell in this image, but I have um, closer up images um, elsewhere in this series, but this yard was just covered in uh, snake skins. Um, and so uh, I had to get out and shoot. So I created um, this character um, that is uh, running around this church. And when Michelle's, you know, speaking and she was talking about Kojic. I grew up in the Baptist church. So there's a lot of similarities with and bringing the idea of trance and all these um, kind of surplus aspects of um, black religion or black Christianity that's um, kind of um, this hybrid of, of traditional religion and the Christianity that was imposed upon us and these kind of surplus moments of trance and ecstasy that I also tried to um, incorporate into the work and, and especially in the ways that the, the practices intersect with, with landscape. Um, next one, please. Um, I also work with uh, fencing masks. They're kind of part of the um, ecosystem of the work. They populate uh, the installation spaces, or sometimes they appear on their own. Sometimes they appear in the images. They also kind of give this haunting um, ghost-like quality to the work. I've seen this old image of African-American soldiers, um, World War II soldiers that were fencing, and I just the images stuck with me, um, especially thinking about uh, soldiers who would go and fight for this country, come back home to 
the same or worse conditions um, and mistreatment and racism and racial violence. Um, and so I just began collecting fencing masks with no agenda and make a lot of them kind of just sat in the studio and I eventually began to embellish them and just work on them. And now they're um, a critical kind of element of this world um, building system. Um, next one, please. Um, there are also sculptural works that incorporate elements of the landscape, different um, textures. You know, I'm, I'm really interested in the ways that the, that the actual material quality of the landscape can act as the main character of the work, not this like, background that we live on top of, but just at least for me and my cultural experience and growing up, just knowing how much landscape was just right there, part of life. So I, I really try to elevate um, the land or like bring it into the forefront rather than again, this like backdrop experience or this thing that we have no choice but to live in the foreground of, but um, for the work. So el these elements of landscape are just our characters in and of themselves. So a lot of them are bodily, they're kind of sort of um, human-like, animal-like, object-like. And so I call them my creatures and they also kind of live amongst the works and, and populate the exhibition space. Um, next one, please. So these are yard signs. And if you drive around the South, you see a lot of art, yard art and just um, really interesting sculptures or paintings or signage that people um, will have out in their yard, especially in rural spaces. Like anytime we would drive to my grandmother's house in Tennessee, um, you'd always see this spectacular uh, yard art. Someone says they love to see the birds chirping. Yeah. Or hear the birds chirping. Yeah. Well, you'll probably, <laughs> they'll probably will get louder and louder um, as the sun sets. Um, but um, so you see these yard, um, yard pieces. Sometimes people have these whole yards. I don't know if y'all have heard of um, Joe Minter or Pearl Fryer. Um, those are some of the kind of famous ones. Um, of course, we all know Noah, Noah Purifoy's um, amazing, um, uh, outdoor installation, sculpture um, moments, I'll call it. And all that is influenced by this, um, this Southern yard art style. So I just, I thought, I thought to myself, what if I could use that yard art as, as a form, as a, um, you know, just as, as painting or sculpture or drawing in and of itself are, for, are form, in and of themselves are form. So I kind of use that and then I'm layering on my own narrative on top of those. So these people always ask me, well, what is that? Is that a cross? Is that, is that a plus sign? What is it? Um, so for me, I think of them as stars and constellations. I, I um, did a, my first um, solo show a, couple, a few years back was at um, Mass Mocha, the Massachusetts Museum uh, of Contemporary Art. And that show, I was really exploring the turpentine industry um, here uh, in Northern Florida. And so I had read this um, quote from a turpentine worker um, who said, we work from camp to camp, which is can't see in the morning until can't see at night. And so basically, in other words, you know, the only downtime that you would get, you know, mi the minimal time you had to yourself or with your family was under the cover of the night sky. The turpentine camps were these brutal uh, labor camps that were out in the pine forest um, here. I mean, it really, the industry kind of made its way down the country. Um, it had a heyday in the Carolinas, um, think of Tar Heels and all that. Um, and then the last kind of gasp of the industry before it went synthetic um, was down here in the North Florida, South Georgia area. And so if you think about like you, how you get um, maple syrup from a maple tree, well, you get turpentine from the pine tree. And so we're known in this region for our um, tall pine trees. If you've ever, if you're not familiar, maybe you've seen those really tall, skinny, skinny, skinny um, pine trees and they just sway in the wind. Well, those are full of turpentine and um, that used to just be huge. It was the second um, largest economy in Florida right behind citrus. So that tells you how big of a deal turpentining was. And it was a de facto slave system. It continued from during you know, the antebellum period on throughout um, the last barrel of turpentine left this region, um, Valdosta, right on the other side of the border in 2001. So this is a really long industry um, and now it's pretty much all synthetic. And really the synthetic part of it really started 60s, 70s, 50s, 60s, 70s. But um, anyway, it was this, this uh, you know, incredibly arduous, um, exploitative uh, labor system. So um, I, I 
just that quote stuck with me. And so I just started making these stars and um, thought about, you know, um, the creation of, of cultural utterances, like the work songs and um, poetry and all of these kind of um, creative impulses and, and fam familial time and downtime that could really only happen at night because every other hour of the day you're working. So um, I kind of began these constellations and homage to those workers. And so some people read them almost like tally marks because they think of my work around hurricanes and climate change or like Red Cross or religious cross because I do also bring in spirituality and ritual into the work. So there's all kinds of readings, but the original kind of thought process behind it for me was um, as a constellation. Anyway, you can proceed please with the next one. Um, these are more of my creatures. I'll just I'll just um, go to the next one because you've already seen a, a creature or two. Um, this is my Ouroboros uh, piece that I did um, in 2017, and um, you know everything that I bring in from the land, it's either um, uh, runoff from another industry, secondhand. Um, in this case, I had friends of friends who were hunting. Uh, for the alligator meat. I mean, uh, down in this region, the Gulf, um, I'm sure Michelle could attest to the um, Gullah Coast and down here, um, alligator meat is very popular meat. And so um, I had a couple people that I knew who were going out and hunting for the meat. And I said, well, can I have the skins when you're done? And so I worked with a taxidermist, we tanned them and I put them into the Ouroboros shape, which is the dragon or the serpent that eats um, uh, eats its own tail in this symbol of creation and this Ravi. Oh, Ravi, that's Ravi is my um, soar, my DP <laughs> from college. She says gator tail is all the rave. So I went to Florida State for undergrad. And when we would play our rivals, the University of Florida, um, our school cafeteria would serve fried gator tail. Um, so Rabbi is saying is on the chat saying that yes, it's a thing down here. Um, but anyhow, so I I try to get everything sustainably and kind of secondhand or something that was going to be discarded or something that was going to be thrown away. So we tan these down, put them in the shape of the of this you know the serpent or the dragon that eats its tail. And I was really thinking about climate change and this simultaneous disruption destruction and the creation of destruction and and how um, you know here in the south the folks that are really getting the brunt of climate change are black folks rural fo folks I mean um, and and that is a parallel to many experiences around the world I mean the people who are um, on the wrong side of the levee or the last to get cleaned up after that oil spill or getting the toxic runoff from that factory, these are not um, happenstance, like random um, uh, factors. There, people have been put different places in the aftermath, in our, in the context of the United States, in the aftermath of slavery during the Reconstruction era, um, and so people have been deliberately placed in different. Um, areas of cities and towns um, that are more vulnerable than others. And so climate change, when we think about it, it's not this, this looming thing that's going to equal, you know, get us all in this equal swoop. It's no, it's happening now for a lot of people, but um, it's, it's, dis it's disproportionate. And so this is kind of thinking about that chaos and thinking about that destruction. And um, because this is where I'm from, I, I brought in um, the uh, ubiquitous um, alligator, um, that rep to represent my um, home region. Um, next slide, please. Um, and speaking of hurricanes, this is a piece that I did at Storm King Art Center in 2018 called The People Cried Mercy in the Storm. And it is um, an homage to the people who perished in the Great Miami Hurricane of 1926 and the Okeechobee Hurricane of 1928. And the Okeechobee Hurricane, as you may know, was the inspiration for my fellow Florida girl, um, Zora Neale Hurston's uh, Their Eyes Were Watching God. And so, um, thousands of black migrant workers were killed in that storm. They were buried in these mass unmarked graves. Um, and the People Cried Mercy in the Storm is an homage to a secular hymn that I found. Um, there's a popular, an old uh, popular form of hymnal singing called shape note singing that comes from the Florida, Alabama coastal region. And um, most of them are religious hymns, but I found this one secular hymn that was singing, it was all about um, the great Miami hurricane. And 
um, it uh, was published right before um, the Okeechobee hurricane uh, came to hit. So this is this a tambourine um, sculpture in memoriam to the people who, who perished in that storm. And in the next slide, you'll see the performance that we did um, called Epo Soundscape for Thousands, where musicians um, did their own interpretation of that, of that hymn. Um, and we performed a memorialization of those lives. Um, next, please. Okay, so next we're gonna show a couple of videos. Um, Sarah says, oh, Sarah says we're up. So actually that might be perfect. Um, so if y'all have any questions, please put them in the Q&A. Thank you. Can this, Sarah, can we show the video um, just a, for a second before, so we can at least have an opportunity to see the videos? Um, yes, definitely. There's, there's one more. Yeah, I think there are a couple more, Deb. If there's if there's time, I'm happy to have those shown as well. If not, we can move forward, whichever works best for y'all. Okay, let's just do this one more and then we'll um, open up for questions. If we have time, we'll go back.
אפשר? אוקיי. Okay. Don't, did not want to stop. Um, if you take time to read the chat, because I, I believe we can actually copy um, some of the moments in the chat. And I had a question, but I think I'm going to just go, um, let Sarah take over the Q&A, but we'll see what happens in the back, because we have I, 15 yeah, minutes yeah. left. <laughs> I, and, and I have so many things I want to say to Allison. Yes, to both of you. I have a lot to say to both of you, but <laughs> Sarah can join us and handle the Q&A. There's so many questions. From Ruby Apple. I love it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. So beautiful and so, um, so soothing, that final video. Mm -hmm. So please enter your questions in the Q&A section. Um, and also in the chat, and I'll go ahead and get started with questions that have already come in. So one person says, Michelle, thank you so much for Rooted. It has been near and dear to my heart since I read it. As a black woman born in North Carolina and raised in South Carolina, I'd love to hear more about your development of the term, term Afro-Carolina and how do you imagine it moving And how do you imagine it moving throughout the world and being adopted into people's vocabulary as they think and talk about the black experience in the Carolinas? Yes, uh, thank you. So I, this is, I'm gonna take a bit of a circuitous journey. I was distracted, Allison, by you saying your sorority sister. Yeah. What is your sisterhood? Uh, the Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. <laughs> oh, okay. All right, Soror. <laughs> so, so this is relevant to the question because I remember, so I pledged at Spelman and that's also part of, to me, what Allison and I are doing is we are talking about the, the, the narratives. We can go there in the moment. But at Spelman, I remember when I first met people who were either from the Mid-Atlantic or from the, the Northeast or from the West in the 90s. I was there in the 90s. I was there before Andre 3000 said at the Source Awards, the South got something to say. And I remember hearing people call people that they didn't think of as very intelligent, Bamas, um, or there was this kind of um, denigration around words like country Um, no one wanted to be Southern. And so, and I remember being, you know, raised in Columbia, South Carolina, deep, deep roots in, in North Carolina, astonished that I was in Georgia at the Atlanta University Center. We're in the South. And people were wanting to not anything but to be Southern. And I remember thinking, I even had this poem that I kind of became no, name, known for called Honeysuckle. And, and one of the lines is that the South is the nation's womb, especially for black folk. And I think that sparked in me a desire to reclaim what Southern means for black people. And then I thought, you know, it's distinctive, you know, Afro-Carolina folk, we're different. It depends on what part of Afro-Carolina you're from. You know, are you from the Midlands? Are you from the coast? Are you from up near the Virginia line or, or down near the Georgia line? And so I've just started playing with it. Um, I will say that I'm not the very, very first person to use the phrase Afro-Carolinian. Um, Robert Ferris Thompson uses it in his, some of his work. Um, and, but I'm, I think I'm the first person to use it in this particular way that I do. And yes, I do want people to use it. I do people want to, I want people to say, I'm Afro-Alabaman, I'm Afro-Texan, you know, I, I am Afro-Californian. Um, and, and let's just talk about that and, and open up. The South is not, When, they, when people say it was the Civil War was between the North and the South, I say, my South won. We've got freedom. So which South are you talking about? Are you talking about indigenous people in the South? Because that's also a multitude of realities. So we can't, this monolithic white Confederate South narrative doesn't work for me. So as Andre 3000 said, the South got something to say. Um, and, and that's part of what I'm trying to, to own and claim. And the, that list of black women from um, particularly North Carolina that I shared, a lot of people don't recognize that Moms Mabley and Nina Simone and Selma Burke are from the Carolinas. Eartha Kitt, I didn't say her name. 
So that's all. I'm gonna be quiet. <laughs> Michelle, that reminds me of how a lot of people call this area Trump country. And it's like, well, they're not really Trump voters in my family. My entire family is here. Like I've I had never lived above the Mason Dixon line until I moved to New York City after college. So it's like my whole family is down here. Um, and so, you know, it's it's interesting the way that it's this country is referenced. And when you were talking about um you know, pre Andre 3000 and all that. And, you know, I, I immediately thought about just this year, like I told y'all in the beginning, I've been home um, during the pandemic. And it was interesting. I was in New York during the Democratic primary. And so when, um, when the South Carolina primary was going on, um, the progressive wing of the Democratic Party was calling South Carolina voters low information voters. And those voters were black women. And um, you know, they did overwhelmingly for the moderate candidate. Um, so the progressives were calling them low information voters. And so fast forward during the pandemic, now it's later into 2020 and I'm down here. And like I told you, I'm 15 minutes from the Georgia border. So we're getting all the ads from the Senate race. And so we're getting, <laughs> inundated. Every other ad is Warnock or Loeffler or Ossoff or um, that other guy, <laughs> you know. Um, and so um, now at that point, it's, oh my God, thank you, Georgia. Thank you, Black women. Thank you, Stacey Abrams. Black women. Black women are saving the country. Black women saved America once again. And I'm like, wait a minute. A few months ago, there were low information voters <laughs> in South Carolina because you didn't like that they were going for the moderate candidate. But now with the Senate runoff is, oh my God, thank you, black women in the South. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I'm like, well, which is it? Are we low information? Are we uneducated voters? Or are we the voters that are saving America? Um, and you saw that again with the Doug Jones, you know, in Alabama a couple years ago. And thank you, black women. So it's like, which one is it? Is it, you know, are we too country to know what we're voting for down here? Or is it, you know, so it's this interesting kind of push and pull and back and forth. It's like, well, what is the South? Is it flyover country? Is it, I mean, what is it? You know, because, you know, my people are in Tennessee. I don't call it the middle of nowhere. I call it the middle of somewhere because it's like way back. You got to, you know, do trains, planes and automobiles to get to where my family's farm is. But to us, it's somewhere, oh, you know. Allison, before we go, mm -hmm. there's a, there's a I'm question sorry. I want to ask from Jenny. <laughs> I'm sorry. There's a question that Sarah wants to ask from Jenny. Jenny, OK. Jenny's question is about your process. So about the process for Allison Hamilton, you mentioned that a number of photos you showed at the beginning of your talk were iPhone images or snapshots, and so not art photos. For you, what is the distinction that you make between these two realms of photography? Is it primar primarily a conceptual distinction, a processual distinction, or related to medium? Um, that's a good question. I think for me, it's, it's a lot more simple than that. It's just like, am I off or am I on, you know, because you can make, you can make movies from your iPhone. I mean, so it's not about the technology. It's not about the device that's in your hand. But for me, it's like, if I'm out with my friends on the water and we're in someone, and one of my friends snaps an iPhone photo of me and there's an alligator or I take a photo of this or that, I'm kind of just enjoying time on the water with my friends and I'm not thinking in that brain but you know sometimes something comes with that and it's a surprise and you can collage it with something else but really it's just more more simple than that. I'm just thinking of like purpose functionality what am I doing am I am I going out to shoot on purpose um am I you know I, I shoot with all friends and family so you know do I have characters that are in the work do I have my lighting kit do I I mean it's like it's more of like the intention and the feeling of like, what am I setting out to do? Um, because sometimes, you know, as someone who works with lens based work, it's like, you don't always want to feel on and sometimes I just want to go out and if I'm outside having a hike or out on the water, I just want to like whatever. And so, you know, I, I'll bring in some of those images into presentations like this, just because a lot of people aren't familiar with the area and don't know what it looks like. So in addition to like, the you know, the photographs that might be on the wall in an exhibition, I'll just bring in some of those just to give a little bit of texture and kind of like hominess to um, to the landscape that you'll otherwise see in like in a presented framed, you know, photograph. Mm -hmm. Dr. Nimana Blyden, did you want to respond, Michelle? Um, I just, I just need to say something that's kind of a little off topic, but I'm just scared that we're going to run out of time. And I just have to say this, Allison, as you were presenting, because of course, I know just a bit about your work, but then I feel like I was welcomed into even more of more of a depth and I was having all kind of visceral reactions 
when you were talking about stars, when you were talking about epic mythologies, apparitions, work songs as poetry, um, secular hymns, storms. I was thinking about Hurricane Floyd and the flooding of Princeville, the all black town in Edgecombe County, Turpentine, you mentioned the Tar Heels. I was thinking about the longleaf pine as one of our species that I consider to be kin to us because just like black folks were extracted for oppressive you know, purposes and, and greed almost killed the longleaf pine, you know, the same can be said of us. Um, red clay, um, the slave canal. I want to get you to, to Afro-Carolina, the northern realm, to see the slave canals at Somerset Place, which is up not far from Edenton where Harriet Jacobs hid. I um, just wanted to put that out there that I felt even more seen, heard, amplified in your work and just want to thank you. Thank you for that. Dr. Nimana Blyden says, many years ago, the playwright August Wilson said, I'm simply saying Blacks should hold on to, to what they are. You don't have to go to Africa to be African. I live and breathe that. Africa is right here in the Southern part of the United States, which is our ancestral homeland. I don't need to make that leap across the ocean. When the first African died on the continent of North America, that was the beginning of my history. And Dr. Blyden's question is, what are your thoughts on this notion of the South as the natural home of African-Americans? I think that's reductionist. I think we're bigger than that. Um, I'm, I'm a both end person. My daughter is half Awe. Her father is from Ghana, West Africa. And I see a lot of, I see my father's eyes in Awe people's faces. And I, you know, the way I put my hand on my hip and stir some beans the same way those sisters, you know, in the Volta region do. So I am, as an Afro-Carolinian, there's certainly antecedent geographies, um, West and Central Africa, Scotland, and, and you know, and, and the British Isles and um, the Caribbean, Barbados particularly. But we, you know, our, our geographies and our identities co can collapse and expand and shape shift and time travel and move. Um, and so, yes, I, 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 I do worry about people skipping over the Black South to head to West Africa in search of identity. It's like, do it all. Yeah, why not? It's all, we're all of that. Yeah, I think both hands. I mean, I, I agree with the quote, but plus, right? Like also our cousins in the Caribbean and South America. I mean, it's all it's all part of the diaspora, right? So it's this continuum, it's this, it's this system of linked experiences and um, nuance based on the availability of natural resources in each location, whether you're in Haiti or Brazil or Colombia or Carolina or Texas or Florida. And so to me, it's that quote, but plus. Um, so it's like, I, I'm not going to say no to that quote, but I will say yes, and, you know, yes and more. <laughs> I think August Wilson's, one of his maternal ancestors was known to have walked from Afro-Carolina to Pennsylvania. So I'm, I'm going to connect everything back to home. So just watch, keep an eye on me. I'll do that. <laughs> so Michelle, one of your neos, Tangela Michelle says, who's an Afro-Carolina Spelman alum and your proud neo says, how do you imagine Black women aligning themselves with the counter narratives of womanist cartographies? How do we, in our own ways, reclaim our lineage through the land? Yes, and I have to acknowledge Shani Jamila is on here too. Also, it's a lot of a lot of Delta shoutouts going on. Um, but okay, it's it's very to me it's very simple. I was in New Haven, Connecticut. And I met a sister named Lisa Monroe who works in African-American studies there. And she said, oh, my father's from Elizabeth City, but I've never been. And that hurt me. I had a, a pain in my body around that. But I said, may I bring Elizabeth City to you? May I tell you what I know about Elizabeth City, or, or, about the fact that Max Roach is from nearby there in a place called New Land, and that just around where your father was born is the Dismal Swamp, where whole generations of maroon uh, societies live. And so it's about pilgrimage, and sometimes pilgrimage or a reclamation. Sometimes it's about physically going there, and that's what I want. 
I want to take people places. I want to do more, you know, uh, heritage ancestral traveling for myself. But sometimes it's about connecting, um, you know, through art um, or having someone bring it to you, which is what I know Allison does. Allison does that for me. Allison takes me places where I haven't been able to put my feet. Um, and I know there's some places in Mississippi I need to get to, um, but I'm, I'm, I'm welcoming all of you. I want all of you all to come to Afro Carolina and, and, and see these places and walk the land. So, so I think reclamation, physically visiting those places and denouncing shame around Southern roots, I think is another thing that we can do. Well, I think we have five minutes left. Is that, are there any other questions at this point, Sarah? We have one more question. So I was wondering if Dr. Lanier can elaborate on the issue she raises in her essay, the question of in situ and or performative work that black womanist cartography requires of us. As she notes, we cannot erect traditional monuments as we have known them. And I think that question of monuments um, might be great for both panelists. Yes, so, so um, I'm not a doctor yet, but stay tuned. Um, so I am, Allison does the work y'all. This is what Allison does. It's like Allison goes into the place and puts her body and I get emotional. You can feel her there. And it's so powerful because she's living as free and expansive and dreaming. And she's putting stacks of tambourines to the sky to honor those bodies that were not consecrated. Tambourines, the sistrum, the same sound as the cicada, those Holy Ghost mamas and, and be, beating, beating the devil back. I mean, the layers of this, go, you know, going there and creating performance pieces and installations and video, video portraits, and just, or just wearing somebody on your body, adorning our bodies. That's in situ. We, we are the land. I'm Afro Carolina. This, and so to adorn my body with the images of those women is also an act of is in situ womanist cartography. Because my body is also the land. I don't know that better than that. So. <laughs> Okay, Aaron, you, are you Sarah. saying something? Yeah. One of the central themes of this two-day research seminar and from the very beginning of the project was about identity. And we have been talking about Black identity, but it's been mainly focused so far on African immigrant Black identity and less so for a variety of reasons on uh, Native-born Black. So you two have opened up a space for me to enlarge that conversation, to talk about Black identity that is uh, US-based, as Southern-based, as Geechee-based. And so I, I am very honored by your presence and what you have brought. And I'd like to know if you wanted to say uh, some more things about Black identity um, from the perspective of Afro-Carolinians and from the Southern space. I, I would defer to Allison. I mean, for me, it's, um, you know, just that we are the diaspora as well. Like, I can't tell you how many times I've heard people say, well, African folks this, Black American folks this, and diaspora mm -hmm. folks this. And it's like, wait a minute, like, we're, the, we're in the diaspora. You know, it's mm -hmm. like, we're part of that. So I, it's interesting, when I moved to New York City, um, one of my friends, who I made, made up there, um, who was from the Gambia, we were talking and I said something and she was like, where'd you learn that word? You know, she was like, that's, that's our, and I was like, my grandma says that, you know, it's like for her, she thought that I like learned some like slang from the Gambia on YouTube or something. It's like, I think there's this idea amongst um, folks throughout that diaspora that everyone else retained their um, heritage and culture and sensibilities that somehow black Americans just like forgot. You know, and so to me, that's, it's fascinating. Um, and it's sad as well that mm -hmm. there's this kind of um, idea that 
Black Americans don't have that continuity of experience or continuity of culture. Um, and we do, I remember um, when I was doing my uh, master's in African American studies back in the day, um, we were listening to the comparison of Condon Blade drum beats to Baptist church hand claps. And, you know, um, you know, it's like, there's this, I, you know, white folks tend to clap on the one and three and we tend to clap on the two and four. And like, you know, it's like the, um, that kind of different rhythmic, um, just intrinsic kind of sensibility that goes from blues to gospel to um, rock and roll to country that is so American and so African. And so our, our systems of hoodoo and the way that that relates to Contemblé or Santeria and, you know, the Catholic countries had that syncretization process underneath the cover of the saints. And America is a Protestant country, but that does not mean that we did not retain that spiritual um, um, tradition from the continent. So I just think that mm -hmm. anything, the idea that Black Americanness is part of the diaspora is so important. And the mm -hmm. idea that we have retained so many of those um, um, those cultural um, forms and nuances. Mm -hmm. and it's just so, it's so important um, to, to know that and to recognize that. Um, it's, it's, it's interesting, you know, I just, I remember, you know, um, thinking to myself like, wow, it's, 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 it's interesting how this location in the diaspora is the one that's assumed to kind of have, have forgotten all that, but it's just, it's not, not the case. And so I think that um, diaspora scholarship would, uh, would would benefit from from treating uh, America as a site just as Haiti, just as Brazil, just as um, you know any other site, Trinidad, you know any of those other locations, and with our nuances, right? Whether that's pre you know post Spanish border or post French Louisiana and um, and the the large Louisiana, not the state as it is now, but that larger region um, and all those nuances that also are brought to bear. But I think that would be for me as a contribution to the overall conference, that's what I would want to leave is that we are part of that diasporic experience, especially when you think about the great migration and you have these first and second generation experiences of great migration from the South to the North, not only country to country. I would like to just thank you. Um, I'm going to pass the mic over to Dr. Harley. But just to end with Courtney Reed Eaton's uh, point, my body is also the land, that mm -hmm. she, she highlighted that. Um, and we thank you because you have re we've received over 70 responses <laughs> to <laughs> the love and respect and the nuances of what we're all experiencing through land, text, through imagery, but also with the sound, this, this whole aspect of circulation. We talked earlier today about migration and circulation through the lens of Dr. Carol Boyce Davies. You've, you've made that circulation happen um, from the land to the water, and we thank you. Dr. Harley? Well, you know, um, when you get a grant like this from the An uh, Andrew Mellon Foundation, for which I am especially grateful, you think you have an idea of what you want to do, but this meeting this public event, the early undergraduate student panel with students, Deb Willis, the students from NYU, and the presentations from our seminar participants, just, you know, Mellon may have had a vision of how grand this was gonna be that exceeded my own expectation because this has just been utterly impressive. So I wanna thank again, Dr. Deborah Willis and Mike Gomez for co-hosting this event. They've set the bar very, very high. I want to thank uh, the seminar participants and Sarah Scriven, who is the program coordinator extraordinaire. And I want to thank everybody who took the time to listen. And there were hundreds of people who listened in. But I want to thank all of you. And stay tuned. We'll send a follow-up uh, information to all of you. Thank you so very much.